welcome to Fireside History. I'm your host, Michael Beschlitz. Today we're going to show you a story from American history that is still playing out before our eyes. It's a story of rapid action with ongoing consequences. The desperation in Afghanistan today, the withdrawal of American troops, the return to power of the Taliban, it all began with a decision immediately after the 9-11 attacks to respond with war. We'll show you through the lens of the NBC News archives how America went from a quiet week in September 2001 to a military footing that would last for 20 years. Along the way, we'll hear from a veteran of Afghanistan and Iraq, now Congressman Jason Crow, and we'll ask him a question that used to be almost taboo. Was the decision to invade Afghanistan made in too much haste? Did we rush into war? Our story begins on September 10, 2001, when President George W. Bush used his fighting words for an altogether peaceful cause against a very different enemy. There's too many of our kids in America who can't read today. Maybe not in this school, but around the nation there's just too many. And now it's time to wage war on illiteracy for the young and to, and to whip this problem early. The next morning, President Bush continued his education tour in Florida, where his brother Jeb was governor. It was September 11, 2001. Yes, the president at a Sarasota, Florida elementary school, about to begin a reading event, gets first word shortly after 9 a.m. in a phone call from his national security advisor. One plane is crashed into the World Trade Center. Minutes later, Chief of Staff Andrew Card leans over and whispers in the president's ear. The reaction on Bush's face, the first sign of more horrifying news. A second plane has now hit the World Trade Center with all indications this is a terrorist attack. Down the floor. Please hear it. Down the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a, a difficult moment for America. I... Um, Unfortunately, we'll be going back to Washington after my remarks. Secretary of Rod Page and Lieutenant Governor <clears throat> will take the podium and discuss education. I do want to thank the folks here at, uh, at the Booker Elementary School for their hospitality. Uh, today, we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and have ordered that the full resources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families and, the, and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. And now, if you join me in a moment of silence. May God bless the victims, their families, and America. Thank you very much. As Bush speaks, chaos at the White House. Staff and press are ordered to evacuate. People run from their offices across Pennsylvania Avenue. Crowds pour into the streets as buildings nearby are evacuated. People gather around car radios for any information fire engines blaze toward the White House. Shortly after 9.30 a.m., the president's national security team is in the Situation Room, a secure communications center in the basement of the West Wing. Vice President Dick Cheney is there, along with National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. Meanwhile, the president leaves Florida, his destination at takeoff a secret. We later learn he's landed at Louisiana's Barksdale Air Force Base. There, he These pledges, attacks. the U.S. will retaliate. Make no mistake. The United States will hunt down and punish those responsible for these cowardly acts. Back in Washington, his top advisor, Karen Hughes, insists the White House has the situation under I'm control. Your federal government continues to function effectively. We have a federal emergency response plan, and at President Bush's direction, we are implementing it. 
By telephone, the president calls New York Mayor Giuliani and New York Governor Pataki. He also speaks with First Lady Laura Bush. The First Lady and Bush's two daughters are also rushed to secure secret locations. Mrs. Bush, on Capitol Hill when the attacks began, tries to offer words of reassurance. Well, parents need to reassure their children everywhere in our country that they're safe. A rare and welcome bipartisan gathering of the uh, Republican and Democratic leadership of the United States Senate and the House of Representatives. This is wild. On the steps of the U.S. Capitol, men and women, black, white, and Asian, conservatives and liberals and independents from all corners of this country, a spontaneous demonstration of unity, a declaration of support for the President of the United States, and a very important symbolic message to be sending around the world and to this country at this hour. Just hours into the crisis, President Bush set the blueprint for what would become a 20-year war. America would make no distinction between the terrorists and those who harbored them. A great people has been moved to defend a great nation. Terrorist attacks can shake the foundations of our biggest buildings, but they cannot touch the foundation of America. These acts shatter steel, but they cannot dent the steel of American resolve. The search is underway for those who are behind these evil acts. I've directed the full resources of our intelligence and law enforcement communities to find those responsible and to bring them to justice. We will make no distinction between the terrorists who committed these acts and those who harbor them. At the time, future Congressman Jason Crow was a college student in Wisconsin. He had spent four years in the National Guard, and at school he had signed up for ROTC. I was actually getting ready for classes that morning. I had made my coffee and uh, my breakfast and um, uh, turned on the news, the TV, like I always did, watch the news before I went in, uh, to, to uh, campus and, and to my classes and uh, saw the planes hitting the buildings and you know, just was watching in horror like the rest of the country was. And, uh, you know, at that time, I had no idea, uh, no idea that that was going to completely change the trajectory of my life. Uh, take me in a very different direction at the time, but uh, uh, that, that did end up happening and it moved pretty fast. When you saw the explosions, did you feel anger? Did you feel resentment, you know, fear, anxiety, all those things that people did? I was angry, primarily. I was angry. Uh, I was shocked. I asked myself, how could this happen? You know, there was a loss of innocence, I think, that we all uh, kind of uh, um, encountered that day, uh, where we, you know, realized that uh, so much of what was happening in the world and so much of the messiness of the world that at least I had growing up, um, you know, that was what was lost. You know, it was here, it was on our shores, it was uh, in our country, uh, but anger mo mostly, uh, watching the videos of people jumping out of that building to avoid being burned. Uh, I was mad and I wanted to do something about it. Millions of Americans felt that same combination of anger and shock. But the decision about what to do in response would come from Congress and a president just nine months into his term. We'll show you what happened next, right after the break. This conflict was begun on the timing and terms of others. It will end in a way and at an hour of our choosing.
His father, obviously, was president during the Operation Desert Storm, the Persian Gulf War. His father had been the ambassador to the United Nations, director of the CIA, and vice president of the United States for eight years before he occupied the Oval Office. There is very little in your experience as governor of Texas or even as a senator of the United States or almost any other job to prepare you for these kinds of occasions. Welcome back to Fireside History. The morning after the September 11th attacks, President Bush met with his national security team in the cabinet room. He was already speaking in terms of war and battles and the determination to win. The deliberate and deadly attacks which were carried out yesterday against our country were more than acts of terror. They were acts of war. The American people need to know we're facing a different enemy than we have ever faced. This enemy attacked not just our people, but all freedom-loving people everywhere in the world. The United States of America will use all our resources to conquer this enemy. We will rally the world. We will be patient will be focused, and will be steadfast in our determination. This battle will take time and resolve, but make no mistake about it, we will win. President George W. Bush, very visible. He's coming to New York City tomorrow. Tomorrow he has declared to be a National Day of Remembrance. NBC's Campbell Brown joins me now once again, Campbell. Tom, the president could not hide his emotion today. We heard from him the strongest language he has used since these attacks, calling this the war of the 21st century and fighting the war the focus of his administration. In the Oval Office, tears welling up in his eyes. The president today fully aware history will remember him by how he leads the country through this crisis. I think about the families, the children. Um, I'm a, I'm a loving guy, and I'm also someone, however, who's got a job to do. The president to vows to, quote, and, uh, whip terrorism, rallying the world to join the U.S. in this fight. But now that war has been declared on us, we will lead the world to victory. The gravity of the battle clearly weighing on the president as he and wife Laura visit a Washington hospital to spend time with the victims of the Pentagon attack to hear their horrifying stories. They talked about escaping, going through fire, and crawling through debris. At the White House, the president is in and out of meetings with lawmakers, key aides, and his national security team, continuing to reach out to leaders around the world, seeking military and economic support, assembling an international coalition to go to war. But in public, the president is focused on the immediate need here at home. On a conference call with New York Mayor Rudy Giuliani and Governor George Pataki, Bush says he will go to New York tomorrow to see for himself the destruction of the Twin Towers to personally thank the men and women searching around the clock for the missing. Well, I can't tell you how proud I am of the good citizens of, that, of your part of the world. Three days after the terror attacks, American leaders gathered for a day of prayer and remembrance at the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C. This conflict was begun on the timing and terms of others. It will end in a way and at an hour of our choosing. It is said that adversity introduces us to ourselves. This is true of a nation as well. In this trial, we have been reminded and the world has seen that our fellow Americans are generous and kind, resourceful and brave. America is a nation full of good fortune, with so much to be grateful for. But we are not spared from suffering. In every generation, the world has produced enemies of human freedom. They have attacked America. Because we are freedom's home and defender, and the commitment of our fathers is now the calling of our time. Thank you all.
Go him, George. I, uh, I want you all to know it can't go any louder. I want you all to know that America today, America today is on bended knee in prayer for the people whose lives were lost here, for the workers who work here, for the families who mourn. This nation stands with the good people of New York City and New Jersey and Connecticut as we mourn the loss of thousands of our citizens. I can hear you! I can hear you, the rest of the world hears you, and the people... And the people who knocked these buildings down will hear all of us soon. and compassion God bless America. to everybody who is here. Thank you for your hard work. Thank you for making the nation proud. And may God bless America. Good evening on this Saturday. President Bush tonight from a presidential mountaintop retreat in Maryland warned the world that war is coming and he warned America that it will require patience as well as resolve. The president was speaking at Camp David where he assembled his top advisors to organize the military and diplomatic battlefields. Meanwhile, at the Pentagon today, the first shots from inside of the devastating damage, much greater than military officials first estimated. It may cost upwards of a billion dollars to repair. Mr. Bush is walking a fine line with his stepped-up rhetoric, trying to isolate bin Laden and those countries like Afghanistan that harbor him without antagonizing other Arab nations whose cooperation the administration is trying to secure. The risk for the president is that other Islamic nations may feel he's declaring war on them too. Also today in his weekly radio address, Mr. Bush attempted to prepare the country for the sacrifice and danger ahead, saying the government is planning, quote, a series of decisive actions against terrorist organizations. Mr. Bush said the terror of this week, quote, will not stand. That is the very same thing his father said before the Persian Gulf War. Make no mistake about it, underneath our, underneath our tears is the strong determination of America to win this war. And we will win it. But we're gonna, as long as it takes, and it's not just one person. We're talking about those who fed them, those who housed them, those who harbor terrorists uh, will be held accountable for this action. Um, and we, we're, go ahead, sorry. Are, are you satisfied that Osama bin Laden uh, is the kingpin of this operation? There is no question he is what we would call a prime suspect. And if he thinks he can hide and run from the United States and our allies, he will be sorely mistaken. Mr. President, do you have a message for the reservists that you called up yesterday? Can you tell us what the May have to be called. My message is for everybody who wears the uniform, get ready. The United States will do what it takes to win this war. This, this, this crusade, this war on terrorism uh, is going to take a while. And the American people must be patient. This is a fight for freedom. This is a fight to say to the freedom-loving people of the world, we will not allow ourselves to be terrorized by somebody who thinks they can hit and hide in some cave somewhere. Mr. I want him hell, I want, I want justice. And uh, uh, there's an old poster out west, as I recall, that said, wanted, dead or alive. American support for going to war in Afghanistan was broad and frequently loud. 
Congressman Jason Crow remembers accelerating his journey into active military service so he could do his part. The mission was to go after Al-Qaeda, to go after those directly who trained and launched the attacks on the United States uh, from Afghanistan. That was the mission. It was singular, it was focused. Uh, and of course, uh, things became very complicated in the years following. Uh, but it was pretty clear at that time. And I remember the country rallying around that, the support around that mission. Uh, and uh, I never thought in a million years that it would morph and change into what it did eventually. Uh, but at that, at that time, it was pretty focused and, and clear, at least to me. However difficult this vote may be, some of us must urge the use of restraint. are just standing around writing different messages, walking around with very sad looks on their faces and hugging, embracing, and just uh, not knowing exactly what to do or what to say. When you pass people on the street, everyone is just looking at each other, all thinking the same thing, all thinking about the incident, all thinking about what happened yesterday. This it seems like the only way we can deal with it is to write it down and I haven't been anywhere, written anything, and as soon as you start writing and you see everybody else coming together, it just brings the community together and we can all see it together because it's unbearable. You can't even believe what happened. Saying all this is very difficult for you? Yeah. Just reading all the different things that the people said, you know, all the different sentiments and all of that. I mean, with everything that was going on yesterday, Everybody running around and all that's going on didn't really set in until now. Just just got off the train trying to make my way downtown. I'm just going to try and see if I can get close to my job. But I just saw everyone around and just reading all the different thoughts and everything. Kind of get an insight into what other people, you know, thoughts and feelings are. It's, it's very emotional. Everybody knows somebody, and we're just all in this together, no matter who we are or what our beliefs are. Did you know? Did you know a lot of people that work there? Right I knew some, and um, just waiting to hear back from people. Like, you left messages for them. I. You know, we're just, uh, I can't even talk. How do you do? I mean, like, what do you, like, how, what, what, is it, what is it like today to walk around and see this? I mean, is it... It's weird. Every neighborhood's different and every, you know, some, a place like this where people can come together and express their feelings, I think, is where some people need to be, certainly is where I need to be. You've just heard the voices of people gathered in Union Square in New York City, not far from Ground Zero. You can hear their pain even across all these years. You can hear them wondering what ought to be said or done. For most Americans in those early weeks, the answer was war. 
For most politicians, the answer was war, but war was not the answer for everyone. We're going to take you now to the halls of Congress, where lawmakers voted on whether to authorize the president to use military force. That vote happened on September 14th, just three days after the attacks. The House of Representatives voted 420 to 1 to give President Bush the authority to use all necessary and appropriate force against the terrorists. The only member of the U.S. Congress to vote against the resolution was Representative Barbara Lee, a California Democrat. Mr. Speaker, members, I rise today really with a very heavy heart, one that is filled with sorrow for the families and the loved ones who were killed and injured this week. Only the most foolish and the most callous would not understand the grief that has really gripped our people and millions across the world. This unspeakable act on the United States has really forced me, however, to rely on my moral compass, my conscience, and my God for direction. September 11th changed the world. Our deepest fears now haunt us. Yet I am convinced that military action will not prevent further acts of international terrorism against the United States. This is a very complex and complicated matter. Now this resolution will pass, although we all know that the President can wage a war even without it. However difficult this vote may be, some of us must urge the use of restraint. Our country is in a state of mourning. Some of us must say, let's step back for a moment, let's just pause just for a minute and think through the implications of our actions today so that this does not spiral out of control. Now, I have agonized over this vote, but I came to grips with it today, and I came to grips with opposing this resolution during the very painful, yet very beautiful memorial service. As a member of the clergy so eloquently said, as we act, let us not become the evil that we deplore. Congresswoman Barbara Lee of California would be the only member of the House or Senate to say no. She was the only lawmaker who believed the greater threat was an American response that went out of control. President Bush would go on to sign the authorization for use of military force on September 18th, exactly one week after the attacks. Mr. Speaker, the President of the United States. Two days later, he addressed a special joint session of Congress. The lawmakers greeted him with a previously unthinkable bipartisan standing ovation. Three straight minutes of applause from both sides of the aisle. Mr. Speaker, Mr. President pro tempore, members of Congress, and fellow Americans. In the normal course of events, presidents come to this chamber to report on the State of the Union. Tonight, no such report is needed. It has already been delivered by the American people. We have seen it in the courage of passengers who rushed terrorists to save others on the ground. We have seen the state of our union in the endurance of rescuers working past exhaustion. We've seen the unfurling of flags, the lighting of candles, the giving of blood, the saying of prayers in English, Hebrew, and Arabic. 
We have seen the decency of a loving and giving people who have made the grief of strangers their own. My fellow citizens, for the last nine days, the entire world has seen for itself the state of our union, and it is strong. Taliban must act and act immediately. They will hand over the terrorists or they will share in their fate. Our war on terror begins with al-Qaeda, but it does not end there. It will not end until every terrorist group of global reach has been found, stopped, and defeated. We will pursue nations that provide aid or safe haven to terrorism. Every nation in every region now has a decision to make. Either you are with us or you are with the terrorists. You heard President Bush there say the war on terror would begin with Al-Qaeda and Osama bin Laden, but that it would not end there. The war on terror would be global extending until every international terrorist group had been defeated. It was the dawn of a new era in America's approach to the world. We'll be right back. The battle is now joined on many fronts. We will not waver. We will not tire. We will not falter. And we will not fail. More than two weeks ago, I gave Taliban leaders a series of clear and specific demands. Close terrorist training camps, hand over leaders of the Al-Qaeda network, and return all foreign nationals, including American citizens, unjustly detained in your country. None of these demands were met. And now, the Taliban will pay a price. You're back with us now on Fireside History for the journey from 9-11 the U.S. war in Afghanistan. Good afternoon, everyone. It does now appear that United States military action against targets in Afghanistan, that that action is underway. The first of these military strikes appear to have just about ended for the night, but officials here at the Pentagon say these attacks are far from over. Missile explosions light up the nighttime skies. Anti-aircraft tracers streak over the capital city, Kabul. The first wave, 50 Tomahawk cruise missiles like these, fired from U.S. and British ships and submarines. 25 warplanes off the aircraft carriers Carl, Vinson, and Enterprise launched strikes from the Indian Ocean. And long-range bombers dropping precision-guided weapons, B-52s, B-1s, and these two B-2 stealth bombers, seen here early this morning at Whiteman Air Force Base in Missouri, flying more than 10,000 miles in 14 hours to drop their bombs. 
At the Pentagon, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld announces the shooting war against terrorism is on. The only way to deal with these terrorist threats is to go at them where they exist. The targets? The Taliban military, air defense systems, command and control bunkers, airfields and warplanes around Kabul, Jalalabad and Kandahar. Also, terrorist training camps of Osama bin Laden and his al-Qaeda terrorist network. But in this first wave, not bin Laden himself. But in a message released late today, apparently videotaped before the attack, a defiant bin Laden issues an ominous warning of more terrorist attacks against American targets. And for the United States, I want to tell the United States and its people, I swear by God, by Allah, he who has praised the sky, that the United States will not have peace. U.S. sources tell NBC News this first round of airstrikes could last three or four days. The most immediate objective, to disarm and disable the Taliban military, to permit opposition groups to take control. That would make it safer then for U.S. special forces to hunt down and root out Osama bin Laden and his terrorist cells. So to bring you quickly up to date, uh, it's now coming up on 1 o'clock Eastern Time in Afghanistan because of the time differences. It is 9.30 there, and a major attack is underway by U.S. military forces. We're about to get the details on all of that from the President of the United States, who returned from Camp David earlier. He'll be addressing the nation from the Oval Office in his capacity as the chief executive of this country, but also as the commander-in-chief of all U.S. armed forces. And as we have been saying, he is also expected to talk in Good afternoon. political terms. Your On point. my orders, the United States military has begun strikes against al-Qaeda terrorist training camps and military installations of the Taliban regime in Afghanistan. These carefully targeted actions are designed to disrupt the use of Afghanistan as a terrorist base of operations and to attack the military capability of the Taliban regime. A commander-in-chief sends America's sons and daughters into a battle in a foreign land only after the greatest care and a lot of prayer. We ask a lot of those who wear our uniform. We ask them to leave their loved ones, to travel great distances, to risk injury, even to be prepared to make the ultimate sacrifice of their lives. They are dedicated. They are honorable. They represent the best of our country, and we are grateful. To all the men and women in our military, every sailor, every soldier, every airman, every Coast Guardsman, every Marine, I say this, your mission is defined, your objectives are clear, your goal is just. You have my full confidence and you will have every tool you need to carry out your duty. The battle is now joined on many fronts. We will not waver, we will not tire, we will not falter and we will not fail. Peace and freedom will prevail. Thank you. May God continue to bless America. After 9-11, President George W. Bush came to start not one, but two wars. The war in Afghanistan, followed by the war in Iraq. Young Jason Crow wound up serving in both of them. Although he was motivated to take on active duty by 9-11, he was sent first to Iraq. Today, Jason Crow is one of several combat veterans from the post-9-11 wars who are now serving in the House or Senate. He talked with us about how he sees those wars now, in hindsight, as a member of Congress. And I had been uh, in the, the National Guard uh, throughout all of college and uh, had joined ROTC after a couple of years. Uh, after my sophomore year, I joined ROTC, so I was doing ROTC at University of Wisconsin along with uh, the National Guard. And uh, my, the plan was that I was going to become an officer in the National Guard because uh, I was doing a program where you would do both simultaneously. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I very quickly realized that that's not what I wanted to do, that I had to go active duty. Uh, and uh, I actually ended up graduating as the distinguished military graduate of my ROTC unit. Uh, and uh, the, the, the distinguished graduate gets to choose his or her assignment. Uh, so uh, in my uh, very infinite 23-year-old wisdom, at the time, uh, I uh, asked for an assignment in the infantry and asked for airborne training and ranger training and um, asked to go active duty, and uh, I got all of that. So I went out, uh, took over my platoon, uh, you know, many of them 18, 19, 20-year-old paratroopers. Uh, we had a couple of uh, months of, of train-up, very rigorous train-up in, 
like my commander uh, had promised uh, in mid-March, we found ourselves at war in Iraq and uh, were in the invasion and, and did street to street, house to house fighting in many places. Uh, and you know, my, my you know, military career started with Iraq. I wasn't thinking about Afghanistan, which of course had already been happening at that time. But uh, what I now realize looking back is how our focus on Iraq and how that was the sole focus for really the, re the rest of that decade. We lost that attention. We lost that focus in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan was just on cruise control and there were missed opportunities. There were uh, missteps. Uh, and had we stayed focused in Afghanistan, I don't know whether it may have changed the end result, but it certainly um, uh, could have helped us be in a much better position. In, in a policy way, if you know, we've got 2020 hindsight that for instance, George W. Bush and Congress did not have in September of 2001. If you and I could go back and talk to George W. Bush and members of Congress a week after the attacks of 9-11, which is when he signed the authorization, as you know, to use force in the Middle East, uh, what would we tell him given what we know now? Would, he tell, would we tell him to do the same thing? Uh, yeah, I agree that um, we should have gone into Afghanistan in 2001 to go after those who um, attacked our homeland. I think uh, uh, at the time that that was a right and just and necessary mission, and I continue to think that. Now, after that initial mission was accomplished, and after uh, we um, killed Osama bin Laden uh, and uh, prevented Al Qaeda from using it as a launching pad for attacks against the U.S. and, and U.S. citizens, you know, that mission morphed and changed into you know nation building, uh, trying to impose an American style democracy on a on a culture and a people and. Uh, a, a place that doesn't have the history of that. Right. Uh, and, and that's the larger debate is, um, should we ever be doing that? Right? Is that a, a something that is, that is, is worth our blood, sweat, and, and treasure? Uh, and I think that's a debate we absolutely need to have. Uh, and, 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 and we need to have it soon because we just can't afford to do this again. How do you look at 9-11 through the lens of everything that's happened in the last 20 years? Yeah, I mean, milestones are obviously important and, and they're, they're moments of reflection, right? We have these milestones, these anniversaries where we sit back and, and sometimes create the, the time and space to, to have reflection and to, to think deeply. Um, but, uh, you know, for me, and, I, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do that, by the way, I'm going to reflect on that and I'm going to probably um, spend time calling my fellow veterans and uh, the, the widows of folks that, you know, we, we, we've lost that I, that I know. And... Um, uh, uh, spending some time talking about the, the individuals, right? And not the politics and the policy, but telling the individual stories. There's no doubt I'm going to spend time doing that in the next couple of weeks in the anniversary. But, um, you know, I've never stopped thinking about this. I don't think a day goes by that I don't think about Afghanistan and Iraq and, and, and the, the, the people we lost um, uh, from a personal perspective. And uh, obviously I've, I've made it a big part of my work in a professional uh, sense as well as a member of the Armed Services and Intel Committee. So I spend a lot of time thinking about this. So for me, um, uh, even though the 20th anniversary will be important in a moment of reflection, uh, this is already a part of my daily life. Uh, and I think uh, so many veterans probably feel the same. Looking at this with 20 years hindsight, did we rush to war? Was a week enough time to consider all the issues and all the possibilities of what might happen? Well, I mean, looking at it with, with the 20 years of hindsight, it's much easier way to look at it than when you're in the, the fog of war and the mix. And, and certainly- That's why it's so much easier to be a historian. So, <laughs> it's true. Um, uh, I can tell you one thing, you know, 23 uh, year old Jason Crow didn't know what an authorization for use of military force was, uh, but, but I knew I wanted to be a part of the response mm -hmm. uh, and to uh, defend our country. Uh, and, and I don't think I was alone in that. Um, but uh, you know, now looking at it with hindsight and, and different, uh, different perspective, and as, as a member of Congress, it actually has to be a part of those debates. Um, yeah, I think it's probably fair to say that there, there uh, should have been more debate about the um, guardrails if we have the debate and we make this a decision that the American people uh, support, then we're actually far more powerful 
in, in response that we decide to make. Uh, and we have uh, much more will and public support for it. And, and our adversaries should be afraid of that uh, because they should know that when the American people come together around something, that it's very hard to stop us. Uh, but uh, we have to put the, the mechanisms, mechanisms in place to have that discussion to create that, that consensus uh, to, uh, to act together. We can hope for an outcome like that. We can hope that hindsight and perspective will play a role in our most important debates. That's what history is supposed to do for us. We can see through history that each of us who experienced 9-11 was changed by it. 9-11 changed our world so that even if you weren't there, your life is different because of it. The war that came so quickly afterwards will be with us and its consequences for years to come, maybe for generations. How long does it take for an event to take its place in history, for us to understand its meaning? Maybe that depends on where you were sitting. Until next time, you can find us streaming and on demand on Peacock TV under the choice from MSNBC. I'm Michael Beschloss. Thank you for watching Fireside History. Starting in 2011, a wave of rebellion swept across the Middle East. It was called the Arab Spring. I was